we are going to transition to our final 17th, I think, and final session of the day. Uh, it is, this has been a tradition at the Ag Tech Summit every year that we welcome a panel of growers and producers because at the end of the day, as we heard it multiple times, this is all about them. And so we wanna hear from them candidly. Uh, we wanna hear from them of their thoughts as how uh, our efforts here in our community can help really uh, move the needle, so to speak, as we heard in our last session. Um, actually, just anecdotally, this session last year uh, was one of the reasons why one of the startups that's in the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator actually decided to grow in uh, its business idea. And so you can hear about that tomorrow at the Ag Tech Accelerator pitch night, and I'm sure one of my colleagues will drop that info in the chat. So I will turn this over to Jim Hedges uh, to moderate the session. Jim is a Central Illinois native. Uh, he's a proud University of Illinois alum, uh, and he represents Winfield United. Some of you might have been here last year when we were honored to have Teddy Beckley from Lando Lakes uh, as one of our fireside chats. And Winfield United is a, I don't know if it's a subsidiary or what it's actually called, but basically is a part of Lando Lakes. So Jim, thank you for being here and I'll let you take it away and introduce your panel. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, just a bit about my, my farm. My farm is uh, in Weekwell, Illinois. Um, it's a corn and soybean farm, and, and we actively use ag technology on the farm. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I'm going to let um, the three panelists uh, introduce themselves, and I'll start with you, Brady. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Brady Holst. I'm from West Central Illinois. Um, it'd be, uh, I'm from Augusta, Illinois, and I'm a typical row crop farmer. We've got about 3,500 acres. Uh, mostly corn and soybeans, and we've got a little bit of wheat. Okay, great. Um, John, I see you on my screen. John, you're muted. Yep, all right. Uh, my, hi, my name's uh, John Williams. Uh, I'm the farm manager at Sola Gradia Farm here in Urbana, Illinois. Um, we are a diversified vegetable operation um, that started at four acres and is now uh, just moved up to 12 acres here this coming season. So uh, we are a nonprofit vegetable farm um, with the main mission of donating at least 10% of our produce to uh, food bank and other food access program um, organizations in the Champaign-Urbana area. Great, thank you, John. And Mike. Yes, um, I'm actually a U of I graduate. I transferred in there and graduated in 1990. Um, I now currently have been at home uh, raising pigs. We used to have sows. Now we're just uh, buying wiener pigs and feeding them out uh, about 17,000 pigs a year. And then we also have about 1800 acres of corn and soy and uh, that we've adapted over time. Um, been very involved with uh, the Illinois pork producers over the years and uh, very proud that actually last year, my uh, second daughter graduated from the U of I there in the agricultural department too, so. Excellent. Yeah, my son actually graduated a couple of years ago from law. So go U of I, right, <laughs> Illini. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna I, start with a, <laughs> I'm gonna start with a question for all three of you. As you think about precision agriculture and ag technology, um, it seems like there's a group of early adopters that, that embrace it, but it has um, a slower adoption rate with the mass of growers. In, in your opinion, why is that? And I'll start with you, Brady. Okay. Um, I think part of it is uh, there's just a lot of options right now. You know, a lot of people are hesitant to, to jump in um, with one company because they're worried about, you know, the upfront cost um, and maybe they want to implement something else down the road and they're worried that that won't work with the system they have. Um, and 
I think that would be most of it. Um, it's, it's tough to think that far down the road, especially with technology that changes so often and there might be something better that comes up um, down the road that you don't even know uh, was in the pipeline or anything like that. So uh, I think that's part of the reason that, at least for us, that it's, you know, you might be a little bit hesitant to adapt and, or adopt some of that technology. Brady, uh, what, what type of technology are you guys currently using that um, you have adopted? Um, one of the things we have adopted that uses a lot of uh, data and technology would be um, soil zones. So we take a lot of soil samples and we take that information and pair it with yield data. Um, and I like that you can pair that data with actual decisions you make in the field. You can actually change your inputs um, even during that growing season or the following year based on the data you get um, from all um, the different, um, I guess, soil samples and, and yield. Um, I think that's uh, one of the better technologies and, and data sets that we use because we can actually take it and implement it um, very quickly. Mike, what, what about you? What, what have you seen on your farming operation? Um, we've tried to adapt things over time. Uh, we're very seldom the first one to adapt. Um, always trying to find a purpose for it, um, see some practical use down the road where it can affect the bottom line in the future before we make a huge commitment into that uh, fixed cost that uh, a lot of times it occurs when you purchase that equipment and uh, data that goes along. Because um, that's one of the things I believe that over the years, uh, we, we've been challenged with is we've gathered a lot of data, at least on my farm, we've gathered a, a huge amount of yield data and all this data for soil sampling and all these things. And we're having a hard time finding ways to, uh, to put it to good use in the future. And like he said, now I believe there's a lot of companies come online now that are finding ways of taking that data that you've had in the past and finding some you know, areas in your field that can be treated differently and finding ways to, to, uh, treat different parts of the operation differently to maximize profits. When you think about that ROI on a total acre basis, I mean, what, what's one of the most impactful technologies that you use on your farming operation? Um, I believe that the yield data and the, going in that combine, getting that yield data out and then being able to match that with some soil maps, with some, uh, some, some different maps that show some drainage. Um, we've done a lot of drainage work, a lot of fertility work off of them using that yield data, overlaying it with some fertility maps, and then over, you know, overlaying that with maybe some watershed areas and finding those key areas that need to be addressed either with tile issues or with some different fertility. I mean, one of the things that we've seen the last few years is, is a lot of work being done with, like he was talking, finding those different soil ranges in the field and finding ways to treat them differently. All soils are not going to react the same to the same fertility and the same, the same varieties and those types of things. They all need to be treated differently. And I think we've come a long way in the technologies of finding ways to adapt to different, different areas in those fields. John, I'll pose the same question to you. Yeah, so going back to your sort of original question of, of what's hindering egg or egg tax adoption in sort of the smaller scale diversified vegetable operations, um, and and this includes us. You know, I, I, the big the big hindrance is uh, scalability, but also you know the scalability down to you know can it can it be worth us in implementing on an acre or two, or you know, in our case, twelve. Um, a lot of these ag tech um, <laughs> tech options are are not designed or not at a price point that makes it advantageous for us to to implement. Um, but you know, I, I surely keep my my eye out on them and and look for the day that uh, you know something is affordable for us. Um, so a question I have once again for all three of you is there's been many different technologies come out over the last decade uh, that in, includes variable rate 
planning prescriptions for fertilizer, uh, nitrogen, satellite imagery, um, UAVs, modeling tools. When you think about all of those areas of innovation that have come on, out, what are the ones that you believe, even if you're not currently using them, will have the most impact um, future, futuristically on your farms? Mike, we'll start with you. Uh, I think all of them are going to have an impact, but I think, like I was talking about, I think it's the merging all those things together and finding ways to utilize them and best find, because different areas of the farm are going to require different things. Um, it's really unique to me. Like they, I was listening to one of the earlier sessions and they were talking about sensors. Well, there's a lot of sensors now that are going on planters and uh, fertilizer and, and, and hydro spars that are actually letting you make decisions as you go through the field and the computer is doing that live as far as down pressure, as far as uh, and making a lot of those decisions as you're moving. So I think those things are going to continue to grow and we're going to find ways to better utilize them. Like I said, on our farm, we're not usually one of the first uh, people to to implicate to 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 make that purchase, but we try to be right there, listening and learning, and being ready to make the adaptation if if it will profit our farm. A follow up question, because you said something. You know, there's you have all this data, um, and you mentioned connect connection, and I I used to have a picture of my planner. I had five different screens, and the data from the five different screens was not connected. So I was overwhelmed with data and no connection between the data. So have you found a way to get that data connected? Oh, that's where I'm, I think there's a lot of uh, people and companies out there that are, that are working on that right now. Um, it's a little above my head, and, but exactly like we've talked, like how you're talking for years, I have been frustrated with all this data. I had a whole computer full of data and not sure how to actually put it into practical use on my farm. But now that we're finding people that can take that data and utilize it, I think it's good that I've, I've stored that up and been able to, to use it because every year is different. So we got to be able to find things that have happened on a particular farm uh, year in and year out, no matter what the environment was. Uh, the, to find those key areas that we can really focus in and fix. Brady, we'll come to you next. Um, from all that uh, portfolio of different technologies I, I brought up in the first question, where, where do you see the most value for your farm, either today or futuristically? Um, really, I see uh, the most impact out of it is, is ones, like Mike said, that um, you know, you can implement changes during the growing season. Uh, um, and a lot of that data, um, a lot of newer companies coming out with ways to collect data during the growing season so you can actually implement it during the growing season. You know, every year is uh, different. Um, so if you can actually go out there and adjust your, your plan of what you're going to do that year to the, the year specifically, I think that has, uh, you know, the biggest impact. It allows to be a lot more efficient. Um, we do a lot of late applied nitrogen. So we'll put on a base rate for uh, maybe a less than uh, perfect year. And then we'll come back in and add nitrogen. And if it's going to be, you know, there's a lot of rain, we'll add a lot more. And if there's not, um, we'll add a little bit less. So it really boosts our efficiency. And you can really see that on the, the bottom line, you know, the ROI on that is, is uh, really great. And um, I think in the future, um, the data you can gather through imagery in season you know um basically daily you could take pictures and and see what's happening i think that's going to be uh really huge in the future where you could uh make those zones based on what the crop's doing you know you can go and right now you have maps based on soil zones and and everything like that but um you can't always base it specifically off those because every year's different the image actually shows what's going on right now and you can react to that um, i think that's one of the most impactful um, technologies that um, could be is out there or is coming. Yeah, I, I would agree. And Anna, as a follow up, um, as you adjust your plan based on what the environment either gives you or doesn't give you, 
I mean, what what specific tools are you using on the farm operations? Uh, we'll go out and do that. Uh, pull soil samples. So we'll see what's in the soil. If there's something that needs to be added um, or um, basically you're just problem checking and seeing uh, what could be done better. Um, so we'll check the soil and see what's actually out there for the plant, if it's available or if it's not. And then we'll do a lot of uh, tissue samples um, to see if the plant's actually getting what it needs. And if they don't line up, we can address those types of problems because it's not always just a fertility. It's, a lot of times it is the plant being able to get those nutrients. Thank you, John. So you mentioned you have a, a diversified vegetable crop. What, what do you see futuristically that could really uh, have some impact on the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I would somewhat echo uh, the, other, the other two guys because I, you know, I, we make a lot of decisions as, as the season progresses. Um, you know, we're, we're turning beds over, changing crops from spring to summer to fall crops. Um, and, and we're making decisions on nutrients and we're making decisions on pest management um, as they arise largely. Um, you know, we do, we do annual soil tests, but um, you know, we're doing a lot of crop scouting throughout the season um, for, for a pest that might need to be um, managed um, or for an unhealthy plant. And you know, the, the more tools that we have at our disposal to help us with those decisions, I, I think the, the better. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna be implementing sap analysis on some of our more higher value crops um, this year that I think will, will hopefully be a, a, a game changer on um, sometimes there not being a lack of a nutrient in the soil, but a lack of a nutrient in the plant itself. So um, help us make some of those decisions in a, in a timely manner to, to keep that plant moving. John, are you using um, any UAV imagery or analytics um, on your high value crops? No, um, and, and I, you know, I, I think satellite imagery or UAV imagery is a space that is going to become available in the short term for us, um, you know, in the next decade or so with, with the price of technology going down in those realms. Um, I, I would not be surprised if I, if, if that, those areas became in our wheelhouse very, very soon. Okay. Um, Mike, I'll come back to you. When you think about some of these new markets, there's a tremendous amount of buzz around the carbon market. Um, right now, the you know there's a lot of focus on no-till and cover crops, but there's other people talking about nitrogen management and those types of things as a reduction of greenhouse gas. Do you see these types of technologies, this data, these tools, um, driving some revenue streams for growers in the future on carbon? Well, I, I actually do. Um, we have been working more and more to get to no-till. Um, we've implemented strip-till here the last two years on our farm to try to maximize the amount of carbon we're leaving on top of the soil. But also, um, I do think that in the future, we are going to be limited on the amount of fertility we can use on these crops. So I think that it's going to become more and more important to be able to gather data, to be able to be able to better time how we apply that nitrogen or, or for fertility and where the best location to apply it is and how we, in the field, what part of the field and uh, to get the best return out of the, the fertility or the nitrogen we can use. And I think those things are going to become more and more of an issue as we as we move forward. And I think uh, these a lot of these technologies will, are going to help us. I know a lot of people that are doing a lot of gathering a lot of data on those that information right now um, and putting it into practical use. Maybe not here in Illinois, but you get out into Ohio and some of those areas, and, and it's a lot bigger. Pennsylvania, there's a lot more focus on those areas right now. Yeah, I would agree. Brady, what about what about your thoughts on this new emerging marketplace? Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely going to be a, a future revenue stream. You know, there's already been 
companies out there that have shown that they're willing to pay money for carbon credits, um, even though they're not uh, forced to. Um, it's just kind of a, a free will thing because they see it as uh, consumers are wanting a company that is carbon neutral, and so they're willing to um, put the money out to, to purchase it. So I think that um, it will be something that sticks around um, and is a, a, a revenue stream. Um, I think a little bit of an added benefit of it will be um, all the research that goes into, you know, how putting carbon into the soil, you know, boosting that organic matter and things like that improves your soil health and uh, just being able to grow a crop. I think that'll be kind of a, a side benefit from all the, the carbon markets um, that are out there that are um, and developing. Are you uh, are you participating on your farm in any of the current cr carbon markets? Uh, not right now. Um, it's something that I've been uh, looking into. Uh, you know, it's hard to make a decision. There's a lot of different options out there, um, and a lot of it's you know putting in work on, on gathering data and things like that. But we do implement uh, cover crops and things like that, and uh, we track our uh, organic matter and things like that over the past because we've seen such an increase um, in the ability to grow a crop. Um, as that increases. So I think it'll be something that uh, we'd be looking into uh, pretty quickly. Excellent. John, I have a question uh, that came from one of the, uh, the, the, the folks listening in uh, specifically for you. And it talks about the, the nonprofit status of your group um, probably causing with the scale you have it it hard to be able to afford to use this, some of these technologies. Is there a program that could be created to help your group and others doing that type of work? So it, it yes and no, um, you know, with being a nonprofit, we do oftentimes have a, a pretty tight budget, um, but what we have over um, some of our farming friends um, that are growing a similar thing, but for profit is we have a, a much larger access to grants and other funding, um, which has which has helped us in the past with with some of our um, technology improvements around the farm. So um, you know, what while the nonprofit budget can be can be tight, we can often you know work our way into to finding. Uh, funding for some of those larger purchases. Okay, great. Um, Brady, we'll, we'll change gears a little bit. Um, I mean, you've, you've looked at a lot of different technologies on your farm and for growers who haven't or who are hesitant to jump into the market, how, how do you suggest they get started with um, precision ag and ag technology? I think the, the biggest thing would be uh, really plan out what you want to do. You know, if you're talking about um, some precision, precision ag, like on planters, there's a lot of options and it's not easy to just jump in all of them all at once. So you really want to plan out uh, maybe what you want to do first and what you might want to do further down the road. And a lot of them are based around a, a single platform. You talked about having so many monitors in your planner and the data sets not working together. Um, uh, really, there's a lot of options now where you can um, get everything on one platform so your data can work together and you can use it um, later on for a lot of other things. So you want to plan it out so you can actually keep it on one platform so the data is together and, and useful. Um, and that way you don't waste a lot of money on, um, you know, putting a lot of investment on a lot of them. Our initial investments pretty high. So you, I would say planning out what you want to do first and maybe what you want to do down the road is a good start. Mike, um, I, I'll pose the same question to you and I'll also ask about, you said you try to try things new on your farm. Um, I'd also ask, how do you decide what new things you're going to test? So first, how, how do you, does a grower dip their toe in the water? And secondly, how do you make the decision on the new things you're going to test? I very much agree with Brady that um, that there is a lot of technology out there and that it, it's hard to figure out where to start. Some of the new technology with the planning equipment and stuff is huge. Um, I think it's very important to, like I talked about earlier, is, is find the data that you already have. 
know your farms, know, try to figure your problems out. Um, one of the reasons we've worked really hard the last few years to move to strip till is, is I really believe we have some compaction issues and some of those issues on our farm. And I really believe that moving to strip till is gonna help us work on that. Now, the next step for us is probably working on changing some things on our planter that can even better help us in putting that seed in a better spot to deal with that compaction and those issues. And then you move on from there. And like I said, but it's, it's knowing and trying to find where your problem areas are and to, to focus on what's the most important thing to start with. Um, where's, your, where's your problems? Where's the best chance of seeing some big returns? And fix the big things first. Don't worry about the little things. Try to get the big things fixed before you work on the little things. How about um, as you decide to go in to uh, look at new technologies, how do you make that decision? Um, for me, I like, uh, for me, I let a lot of other people try to make the mistakes with it and try <laughs> to watch them and learn and ask a lot of questions. Uh, you know, see what that neighbor's using, talk to them in the winter months and see how things work, what's working the best. Um, it, Somebody's got to be the first, but it doesn't always have to be you. So um, talk to talk to other people. Go to some meetings. There's a lot of meetings out there that gather data on that. They do a good job of of explaining how these different things work and uh, how how to implement them into your farm. So utilize knowledge. Utilize knowledge. your own as well as others. Yeah, you don't have to create the wheel every time, right? That's right, um, <laughs> John. Um, so you have a, a bit of a unique perspective. When you think about your operation and what, what do you think could have the biggest impact um, that you're excited about as, as you continue to grow that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's sort of a weird one because it's not based around computers, but I, I think there's a, a growing space for uh, mechanical cultivation um, in small scale vegetable production. And I think there's some great organizations like Hillmore out of Ohio that are really um, revitalizing this, this space for mechanical cultivation to cut back on some of the hands and knees weeding of, of carrots that um, my staff all knows so, so well. Um, you know, and, and I think there's, there's tools and technologies out there that are, you know, very customizable to fit all the different um, needs of all the, you know, of farmers um, in our, in our sort of sphere that, um, that I think can really be, um, be a game changer for us is, is if it's, it's something that we can customize really down to the, the crop and the, soil type that we're, we're trying to do the work in. Okay, um, I think we're about up against the clock. There was a, a great question that just came in and it's, it's actually about five questions. So <laughs> I'm going to ask, um, it's around the carbon market and the financial incentives around regenerative ag. And what it, it asks is, do you believe that some of the offers out there offer short-term incentives for you to switch the way the way you farm and are they um, enough to make you or to cause you to do changes to the farm? Uh, Brady, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody really knows that. Um, I guess you're talking about maybe the, the price point they pay um, for a ton of, of carbon um, and if it's worth um, actually storing that carbon in the soil or not. Um, I think it's hard to judge on where the, the price of a ton of carbon is actually going to go because it's so early. Um, you know, it could be a lot lower, a lot higher once the market gets, um, I guess, a lot more um, stable and uh, more common. Uh, but I think, you know, where the, the price is right now, I think it's worth um, a, making changes to actually, uh, you know, put in uh, practices that would store more carbon into the soil just because you're going to see uh, an increase in your uh, crops, you know, your soil health is going to be a lot better. Um, I think even without the carbon market, a lot of those um, are worth doing. Um, 
Mike, what are your thoughts around this carbon market and uh, changing practices? I think there's no doubt that we're heading that way. We have been working with cover crops and some of these options for multiple years on a small scale. Um, we've yet to perfect it on our farm. Um, I've talked to some other farms around here where they've had much better luck than us, but it doesn't mean we're giving up. We're still working on it. We're still trying to find ways to, to, to better utilize that and leave more carbon in the soil. But uh, it, if there's a big enough incentive, it'll change faster. There's, there's no doubt. Everything in our, everything in our industry is, is money driven at the end of the day. If, if there's a big enough incentive, people will work much faster into changing it. Um, but but it, it's not, sometimes it's not easy to make those changes either, either. but incentives will help. Right. John, I mean, you have a, uh, once again, you have a different perspective. What are your thoughts on carbon? Are you guys exploring that at all? Uh, we're, we're not really because we're at a scale that the, the benefits are, you know, it's, it's the time management of signing up and managing that. We're already doing cover cropping and other um, regenerative practices around our farm. What, what I think I'm hopeful to see in carbon markets is the use of some um, perennial crops, uh, alley cropping, um, things that are not just a, a one-year um, carbon sequestration solution, but a, a multi-year that can really have more long-term benefits to, you know, the whole carbon sequestration equation. Well, thank you uh, to John, Brady, and Mike for joining us. That 25 minutes went fast, and I can see Laura is getting ready to pull the plug on us, so um, thank you uh, once again, and, and thank you uh, for the opportunity.